Okay, let's address one of the most common misconceptions regarding the tithe. Go ahead, search the first page of Google and note how many say, the results say, that the tithe is only food. It's food. It's food and nothing else. There's nothing else to see there. Those people cannot even read. And that's a shame. These are not Bible scholars, nor even reliable blogs or honest people. Now, I know some of our viewers, in fact, have repeated this. And, hey, we have in the past, too. Not necessarily uh, on this channel, but years ago. Uh, this is not about condemnation. We're just researching the truth, which you well know you're going to get here. These non-scholars... They're the origin of it. Really are illiterate of the times and, uh, well, what food was used for in those days. And worse, they can't even read the passage, which also identifies things like, well, clothing. That's not food, right? We haven't started eating our clothing, have we? They, they didn't do that back in the day either. Hmm. Uh, yeah, labor. Oh, really? Uh, that's not food. Spoils of war, including gold, gold, silver. Uh, yeah, uh, that's not food. Uh, so obviously, these aren't thinking at all because they're not even reading the passages, even in the modern Bible canon that say these things. Um, now, we know this because we've covered even Abraham and Jacob, but we'll get to that a little bit in this video too. They don't know, and they really don't care because, well, these people, they typically, they hate the Old Testament. That's the reality. Uh, again, just look at the likes of John MacArthur, and it's very clear. The guy just hates the Old Testament. He hates law. He doesn't want anything to do with any law. He wants, well, lawlessness, which is the definition of sin. They are told to ignore, uh, so when they go into it with no basis or foundational understanding, they just spit out the dumbest doctrines you could ever read, which is what we see on the first page of Google oh, and beyond. This, as you see, gets picked up and repeated over and over to the point that you just begin to accept this trash theology because it was passed down by so many credible sources, yet neither is credible at all. Uh, not on this topic, it, they are illiterate. First, what was food in 2000 BC in a barter society? Yeah, people ate food, but what else did you use it for? It's pretty easy to identify, yet those clearly wish to remain willingly ignorant. No more. We're not putting up with that here. Here we go. So what was currency in the ancient society, uh, you know, before they could mass produce gold coins, for instance? Uh, when barter and trading uh, one item for another was the modus operandi, the standard method, principally. Yes, they had shekels back then, and we even see that in the Bible, but there were no mints yet, not for centuries later, especially from the time of Moses and the time of Abraham. It didn't happen. So they were not distributed enough to replace all the barter that was going on then. And by the way, barter still exists today. It is not completely disappeared. So it's not something that you would think a scholar could mistake, yet they mistake it on a regular basis on this topic. Some would use items rare in nature, some cultures, such as uh, the Philippines used beads. And you find beads in ancient archaeology that date all the way back uh, to the BC era. Uh, and, and you'll even find that they're, they're beads uh, that reach the Philippines from Persia uh, and other areas of the Middle East. And it doesn't make sense because we don't actually know the history 
though we've restored that in Solomon's Gold series. You should watch it if you haven't. Uh, some would use shells uh, as currency, in a sense, but these were all limited. Uh, and still, if you wanted to buy something in cultures around the world, the number one way you did so was through barter or trading an item you own for something someone else owned, which you desired. Pretty simple. Realize we, again, still do this on some levels to this day, though, of course, now we have monetary systems that have taken over with, unfortunately, fiat currencies, uh, fake currencies that have no backing and no actual value other than what is perceived, which is just, I mean, prime for major theft and fraud, which happens every day on a major scale. Uh, unfortunately, it is the major bankers who were taking advantage of it the most. This was not the case back then, though, uh, in terms of, again, they didn't have printing presses for money. Uh, they didn't have forgeries for uh, casting uh, mass gold coins. It just didn't exist yet. People even used uh, live animals, uh, such as cows, uh, all the way up until recent times in trade, in barter, as currency. So when the Bible says you tithe cattle, you are not just tithing an animal that is only good for food anyway, which is a nonsensical way to think. I mean, how, how does a scholar forget that, you know, oxen, uh, for instance, are used for labor? How do they forget that sheep are used for their wool and the wool then to make clothing clothing's not food last i checked um you know a cow was money currency uh, so was a sheep essentially in the ancient world and again even to modern times so this really shouldn't be a surprise to any scholar uh if they were academic enough to do even a little bit of research i mean a quick Google search, and they would have known better than to say some of these really dumb things uh, that the first page of Google says. We're not going to go through them all. We don't need to. You've heard them. We've all heard them. Uh, the tithe, tithe is only food. Tithe is only food. Tithe is only food. Tithe is only food. Nonsense. Illiterate. That is not what the Bible says. That is it's just wrong, even in the modern Bible canon. It is uneducated nonsense. Again, there were shekels back then, but no one had a mint. No one was able to forge uh, them in mass until about 600 BC. And even then, you know, it still didn't just take over one day. It took, you know, a, a thousand years or more. So Moses lived long before then. Understand that. So when he wrote those passages that everybody loves to quote that says the tithe is food, the tithe is food, the tithe is food, the tithe is food, when actually they can't even read the things that are in the tithe, some of them aren't food. Some of them have uses other than food. So again, they're not even trying to read. Most of the passages about tithing food and animals do so because food and animals were currency. They were money. So anyone saying the tithe was just food is really thinking in hollow terms, forgetting how things operated. Let's cover a little of this history. The tithe of the land, of the herd, given in a heap. You know, many passages that we could cover here. Uh, what is this? Well, it's not just food. These are money in that age currency used for trade here's a basket of apples now i'll trade you for a basket of camote or sweet potato in english this is really not difficult uh, but many scholars really just repeat this lie that the tithe in the bible is only food it's only food it's only food uh no it's not Corn, which, uh, well, again, is not just food for people, but also for animals. Uh, wine, which can also be used for other purposes, not just drinking, um, such as cooking, for instance. 
Oil, which, uh, by the way, includes the kind of oil that is used in lamps, okay? Not just for food. Herds, flocks, yeah, absolutely. But again, sheep have other uses. Wool, clothing, um, not just food. Uh, and they have other uses even beyond that that are not food. But oxen were used for labor, how could one forget that? Scholars do when they say, oh, it's only food. No, it's not. It is not just food. Why the increase of all thy seed? That was the increase of your income for that year. Um, that's the way that it worked. Your income in those days, it was an agrarian society. So everybody principally grew food, grew plants. Oh, by the way, not just edible plants, but other types of plants too. And they also would be the yield, the produce of the land. So they still would be tithed on. Yes, uh, you eat your crops uh, yourself, uh, largely indeed, which is, well, still money because you don't have to go out and buy those things, those groceries. Um, see, it's it's not difficult. However, it is a trade commodity used as currency in that age of barter. Here's a passage that adds honey, which also can be used to, well, let, let's see what's the old adage, uh, you catch more flies with honey, right? Uh, that's a different purpose, uh, not necessarily food. Uh, yeah, the flies think it is, but it's not for people, and that's not its purpose, is it? Uh, there was a treasure house or storehouse in those days that the temple priests kept uh and obviously they would uh take the perishable items and they would distribute those quicker uh in others store and use throughout the year but they didn't just use them for food they used them for trade for currency for money now, for those that say, oh, Yahushua never said anything about tithing in the New Testament. Sorry, folks, that's stupid. He most certainly did. First of all, in Matthew 5, he makes it clear that his law remains every letter of it. He doesn't have to say which parts it is. He said every letter, every I, every T remains until the day of judgment. So if it remains till the day of judgment, he doesn't then need to say, oh, don't forget to tithe. Don't forget to keep the feast. Don't forget to keep the Sabbath and my law. Well, he did still say those things. That's the amazing thing. Um, and yet we're told, oh, he never said, you know, yes, he did. He preached these things. There is no verse that ever says, stop keeping my birthday and, you know, on Shavuot, the Bible feast day in June, and start celebrating, well, the birth of my enemy, the sun god, because, well, you know, that's cool with me on December 25th, because, you know, might as well just celebrate his birthday instead. Isn't that, doesn't that sound like something he'd say? Well, no. Do we know him at all? Does the church know him at all? He hates Christmas. He hates Easter. He hates even the feast days that match the Bible if they're being carried out in a fashion uh, by unbelievers uh, like Pharisees uh, who were defiling it. And in their case, they even changed the uh the the dates the times everything so uh and they've added all kinds of things even for passover one of the biggest feasts they added an egg oh just like easter eggs and bunnies right what are those fertility symbols of Easter? uh yeah the moon goddess the sun god the moon goddess this is just sounds like something he'd embrace right where what scripture ever says he would he says the opposite. He will have no association. When you invite Zeus and Apollo over for Christmas dinner, he will never be there for one Christmas at any time, regardless of what happens. Now, however, he comes right out and directly says, do not neglect the tithe. What? 
Oops. Can these so-called scholars even read? I know some try to explain this away, but you can't. The language is so clear. In Matthew 23, 23, he rebukes the Pharisees who tithe, specifically their mint, anise, and cumin. But they forget the weightier and more important matters uh, because, see, well, tithing, well, it's not salvation. You, you know that, right? Uh, it, we've never preached that it's salvation, and no one should because it's not. The law never said it was salvation. The law never said keeping the feast is salvation. The law never says that uh, Sabbath is salvation. Yet, I know that's what detractors try. Oh, you're saying that that's what saves you. No, the law doesn't save. Yahushua does. And he did in the Old Testament too. That hasn't changed. And they knew that. However, he says in law, oops, Yahushua preached keeping the law many times. Any church saying he didn't, well, they just simply can't read. Matthew 5, again, a perfect example. We could go through many, but we already have. Uh, if you watch our videos on the Sabbath, Feast of Yahuwah, uh, what did Paul say? Uh, we deal with it in all of those many times over. Uh, judgment, mercy, and faith. Well, Pharisees had neither. They, they didn't do either well. They were not just uh, at all, uh, for the most part, uh, they did not actually keep his law, but their manipulated interpretation in leaven. Said Messiah many times, they had little mercy, if any, just look at Yahushua's story for that matter. Uh, they have in uh, faith, uh, yeah, right, Pharisees, faith, you got to be kidding. They had no faith. They had a lack of faith, and Yahushua called them out for that as well. Uh, because they serve a different God, representing a different religion, which is the same today as Phariseeism, uh, which became Rabbinic Judaism, uh, even according to the Jewish Encyclopedia. They admit that. Uh, he then clarifies, these ought you to have done. What did he say? What does that mean? He says, tithe. Do not neglect to tithe. Do the other things, but you need to tithe. That's what he said, period. There's no other way to read that. And I know there are commentaries out there that try to wrangle and do gymnastics. And they're, they're you know, every one of them that we've ever read that try to do that are just utterly stupid. They have no clue what they're even talking about. Yes, he did say so. And just here, and don't leave the others undone either, right? So he, when you say that, he's not then abandoning the tithe. He's saying, don't leave any of it undone. Do it all, right? I mean, that's pretty simple. Those are his words. How do we not know them? In the KJV, 2 Kings 12 does say they gave money as well. It's right there in the passage, money. In English, of course. So let's not pretend the Bible never mentions it in this manner of giving. It always has. Again, Genesis says Abraham has and kept the law. Whoops. What law? I thought Abraham didn't have law. Of course he had law. He was judged righteous. How can you be right when you don't know right and wrong? That's... I mean, I cannot imagine the church has framed this so poorly for all these years. So what law was he under? That of Melchizedek, who was his high priest, Yahusha, in spirit form. Watch the first tithe where we prove that and our two Melchizedek videos. Yahusha transferred the priesthood to men or flesh to the Levites temporarily. So that when he became flesh and dwelt among us, he, in the flesh, could restore his order of Melchizedek, the ancient order, not a new one. You will find all ten commandments in Abraham's words. We've covered that in rest, the case for Sabbath, uh, as well as, and that's available free in ebook at restsabbath.org, or uh, you can view our videos on that in the Sabbath series as well. Jubilees 13 identifies the tithe was written as law 
in Abraham's days, and it was not just food. We covered Jubilees 32.1 in the last video, Jacob tithe, gold, and every vessel, and garment. This was not just about food, ever. He gave tithes of all increase, everything, not just food. And that's according to Genesis as well. This became written law according to Jubilees 32.10, written on the heavenly tablets kept by the angel of the presence, the archangel, likely Michael, though we don't know which one, but there are four holy archangels who stand in the presence, angels of the presence. Abraham tithed to Melchizedek of the spoils of war, including a tenth of all, including gold and silver. This also became written law, according to Jubilees, as we covered. What law again? Not Moses, but Melchizedek, who is Yahusha. He's the only one that qualifies. He's the only one that could be the Prince of Righteousness and the Prince of Peace, the King, king and King. Uh, and we have returned to his high priesthood and order of Melchizedek. Look to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, especially for specifics on how we should be operating. No, we don't sacrifice anymore because Yahushua became our sacrifice, but he did not replace his law. He did not replace his Sabbath, his feast. Uh, you know, these things remain. And there isn't a single scripture which ever says that they do not. And that includes Paul, who taught the Sabbath, the feast, and the law, and said that they were holy, just, and good. I must keep this feast. He was emphatic. They even say it about circumcision. Oh, Paul preached against cir circumcision. No, they can't read. He was responding to Pharisees who were saying that circumcision was salvation, which is a lie. That's never, ever scripture. And he was telling male, adult Gentiles, you do not have to be circumcised to be saved. However, after that, he goes and circumcises some of his disciples, even Timothy for that matter. So what did he do? Break his own rule that he changed without such authority yeah right paul didn't change anything and anybody reading paul that he did is either calling him a hypocrite and that's why there's a movement to throw out paul's words which is also equally ridiculous because it's based on that faulty assumption and the church's application where they're taking the fragments of paul out of context and then they take that horrible lousy context and treat that as if it's actually factual and then rail on paul over something he didn't say and uh, you know and he kept the law uh and said it was good it's amazing you know this was happening two thousand years ago peter actually says in in second peter three i think it's verse 17 but somewhere in there he says that they were twisting paul's words way back then you think it isn't even worse today 2,000 years of leaven, imagine that. Now, again, this is according to Hebrews 7, which connects the Old Testament giving and the law, and actually chapter 4, the Sabbath as well as the feast, uh, to what Abraham did. Uh, Abraham obeyed uh, the law. What law? The law of Melchizedek. The Levitical priesthood came next, and Yahusha set them up, uh, in his stead, uh, and then transferring the priesthood to man, right, which was imperfect, but that's the way it needed to be. Um, he then came and he disannulled, in other words, he completely canceled out, defaulting back to the order and law of Melchizedek with Yahushua as our high priest. Watch the first tithe where we really explain that very well and cover the whole, the whole chapter, in fact. Uh, you can't miss this in the passage. You just can't. You can't really read it any other way. 
Uh, and you'll never understand the New Testament without getting this. The church doesn't. Generally, the church has no idea about the very basics of what we should be doing. And that's scary. Very scary. Again, this is Hebrews, which is in the New Testament. And here's the whole chapter establishing that they continued to tithe as Abraham. That's after Yahushua's ascension. So any church declaring the law passed away is illiterate. They don't know what they're talking about. They're just using fragments from Paul out of context because Paul never says that. They mix up the law of sin and death, which is not the law of Moses. We cover that in uh, What Did Paul Say? Check it out. So is the tithe food only? Nonsense. This is a terrible way to read scripture by so many stupid scholars. They're the origin of it, not you and I, none of us regular folk. Uh, they just, these scholars seem incapable of reading basic sentences and they don't even know how to research a little bit of history that a child could do. Food and cattle were currency in those days uh, where barter was the monetary system with few shekels in circulation. They gave of that which they used as currency, as, I mean, so do we as today. Um, Abraham gave of the spoils of war, including gold under Melchizedek, money. And Melchizedek is Yahusha. His priestly order has returned. We're not under a new priestly order. We're under a new covenant, but we're under the ancient priestly order. Isaac did too, and we have shown you passages that he indeed obeyed the same law as Abraham, though tithing specifics are not given, but why do they need to be? If it says he kept the law that Abraham had uh, and established, and you know that when Abraham tithed, it was written as law on the heavenly tablets, then anyone saying, oh, but it doesn't say Isaac tithe is stupid. They're just not able to read. We then, and I mean, that's just basic logic. I, if you can't use basic logic, just forget about trying to read the Bible. You, you, you've already lost the battle. It's screwed up as it is in this day and age. Uh, we have to use uh, logic and common sense to, to get there uh, and listen to the Holy Spirit because he isn't saying that. We then see uh, Jacob giving the same, a tenth, a tithe of everything, including money, gold, vessels, clothing, men even, and of course, food, which was currency in value, not just something you eat. Again, sheep are more than just food, it also leads to clothing, oxen are labor to plow the field as well, among other things. Horses are used for transportation as well as camels. Uh, hello, <laughs> I know, replaced by cars now uh, for many or motorcycles or whatever, but they were valuable as currency in those days. They were money. Even oil is used in lamps, wine for cooking even. Several of these categorized as only food by inept scholars who can't read and do not represent even common sense. Well, there you go. We all know this if we just use a little common sense, a little logic, and do a little research. Something most scholars seem to lack greatly, unfortunately. Why? Because they live in a paradigm that handcuffs them. Uh, they're well-meaning people. Your pastor's not trying to deceive you, of course. He's probably a very good man. Most pastors, I won't say all because I don't know, but most pastors are. They mean well. They care about people. They love people. They want to serve you. However, if they're not researching the word, if they're not proving all things, if they're not testing, then they're not guarding their own heart and they're not guarding their flocks. Unfortunate but true. Tithing is not only food, but of all increase. Everything, everything for that year. And we do it annually. Again, we cover the details on how it works, breaks down in a cycle of three, uh, one year, two year, third year. And we cover that in the previous videos. If you haven't watched them, watch. 
We have over 550 videos on YouTube with alternative platforms in the description box. Please remember to like, subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. But since YouTube seems to be broken at times, at least for our channel, anyway, uh, join our email list uh, on our website. Just go to thegodculture.com and put your uh, email address there in the pop-up. That's all. Uh, we'll notify you ourselves. Uh, we'll let you know when videos come out and when books come out. And that's pretty much it. Uh, we have published 10 books now in three years with more to come. You can download free an ebook at ophirinstitute.com or purchase in print internationally. All links are there. Our Instagram was hacked but is now back up, so check it out. And we also started TikTok recently, but uh, sorry, no, 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 no. I know some have asked. No dancing. Nope, not happening. We will also be appearing on Zen Garcia's show in the U.S. somewhat regularly. Uh, and back to the Philippines, we are always mindful of our viewers here creating videos. Uh, and now uh, in Tagalog, even books, uh, including Solomon's Treasure, which is out already in ebook, coming soon in print. Our next book coming very soon in Tagalog, Filipino language as well. Uh, we have like 70 videos in Tagalog, full narration, uh, I, I believe now. Uh, all books free in ebook at ophirinstitute.com. Watch our viral Solomon's Gold series. If you're Filipino, you really, really need to watch that. You, it's going to blow you away if you haven't. Um, it's in English and Tagalog for much of it. Uh, we are working on Solomon's Treasure in Ilocano right now as well, coming soon. And we have some really big projects working right now that we can't announce yet, but we can't wait till we get them far enough that we can tell you all about them. We love you guys, and we're glad you are here. Always remember, prove all things for yourself. God bless to everyone. About 382 AD, in the days of Jerome, known for the Latin Vulgate, a new term began to circulate in Bible scholarship, according to R. H. Charles. Certain texts of historical value, and even canon, were now labeled as something other than inspired scripture. The very concept is a clear redefining of books already in existence, and in most cases, text recorded as inspired scripture and Bible canon now somehow in question by those without any such authority. This paradigm remains today even further rooted as if it ever represented the historical approach to these Old Testament texts as some vet as truth. How do these texts stand up to the Torah test? The answer on many of these books will likely shock especially scholars 
who have never actually conducted such research, which becomes evident. It's not in their paradigm. This canon was already chosen before there were Pharisees in Jerusalem and before there was ever a Catholic church. Those factions do not get to legitimately form councils to vote on that, which was already settled, fact, long before, even in archaeology. You are entering a zone for truth with our new Apocrypha test series. Follow along, and together we will dispel the myths of modern scholarship. And man, are they profoundly lacking in intellect on this topic you will see not anymore download your copies of volume one and volume two of our comprehensive apocrypha research free in ebook today or get your copies at apocryphatest.com all links are there we now begin